Welcome, everyone, to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm Gabriel Custodiet. I'm very pleased today to be joined by a repeat guest, Mikkel Thorup, who I have come to trust more than any other international internationalization voice out there. Um, and I really appreciate that he has a philosophical backbone, <laughs> unlike a lot of people out there. So, uh, Mikkel, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Very good. Very happy to be back, my dear friend. And, uh, and I'm excited for today's conversation. I'll just say this once and once and for all for this episode, uh, nothing in here is tax advice, legal advice, or advice of any kind. One of the reasons that I have Mikel on is because we're about to announce a Panama excursion. And this is a joint venture. Mikel is involved. I am involved. And Joshua Sheets of Radical Personal Finance, who you will know from the courses that I do with him, is involved. And this is a seven-day trip in Panama in January of 2024. Uh, spots are limited. Uh, Joshua Sheets will also be advertising to his audience, so they will no doubt devour it. So if you're interested, I would look into it and make a decision sooner rather than later. So what are we doing on this trip? Well, it's an internationalization event. We're going to learn how to make the most of Panama. There's going to be presentations on, on taxes, immigration, banking, precious metal vaults, real estate, doing business in Panama, wealth protection. I will be presenting in the uh, event. Joshua Sheets will be presenting as well. So we're also going to have a couple of trips. Mikkel will be presenting as well. And we're going to have a number of trips, which Mikkel will explain in a moment. And along the way, you're going to have good meals, good accommodation, good company of like-minded people. You'll have access to me, to Joshua, and to Mikkel. And hopefully you will remain connected with Mikkel above all, because he's the expert in all of this. You'll also be escaping to Panama in the dead of winter for a lot of you who live in the frozen north. Uh, for some of you, that vacation itself will be the best of all. So uh, in summary, it's a chance to see a great country for freedom-minded people with freedom-minded people and to take your first steps to internationalizing and to do so under the guidance of experts. And of course, it's also a chance to support us as well. So Mikkel, is there anything I missed in the high-level summary? Maybe you could also uh, say what you wanted to say, including about the trips that will be going on. Yeah, no, I think you did a fantastic job summarizing. The main thing that I would like people to understand is that we're doing this trip because we are very much like-minded people. We see what's happening out there in the world, and we realize that we have a, a responsibility, a responsibility to ourselves and a responsibility to our families and our community to really protect ourselves and defend ourselves from what's going on. And I think privacy and protection are are really important pieces of that. Now, Gabriel, you do a phenomenal job on a lot of the privacy things. What we're going to be doing and kind of where the overlap is the privacy in the banking, the privacy in the structuring. So we'll be looking at different types of, of foreign vehicles in the offshore markets like um, SAs and LLCs and IBCs. We'll be looking at uh, the Panama Private Interest Foundation. My lawyer will be coming in to give a presentation about that. So this is a lot of the practical sides of the privacy and really legally how we can protect, uh, protect ourselves. The other big thing that we'll be doing is the field trips. This is what I affectionately call our little mini trips that we do on the conference. So the way that we structure things is conference material, like traditional conference material in the morning for two, three hours. And then in the afternoon, we do field trips. So we're going to be going out to see a self-sustaining community that, that I am building with a business partner of mine. We acquired 55 acres of raw land in the highlands of Panama. It's about five, six, seven degrees cooler than being at sea level, which is Panama City. But this is a, um, a physical community, a gated community of like-minded people with solar panels and well water. We sit right over top of um, an aquifer. So there'll be fresh well water there. There's going to be fruit trees on site and everything like that. So it's really um, a very special place. So we're going to take a, a trip out there. We'll have lunch. We'll get to walk the property. We'll do a presentation with my business partner who can answer any questions about it. Um, another one of the field trips we're going to be doing is going out to my friend's gold vault. So they have a really impressive gold depository about half an hour drive from my house here in Panama City. And um, they're a group of um, really like-minded individuals. They're very 
paranoid individuals, and I love them for it. They they spend the first hour of every single morning thinking about how they could be wrong or what could happen if they, they get the situation wrong. And they're constantly trying to find ways to plug these holes. So they've been doing this for a really long time, and it's a special experience because most people never get to see the inside of a gold depository. We're talking about a location with literally two, three hundred million dollars worth of precious metals in it. Um, so that's going to be really neat. And then we're going to go out to the beaches. We're going to go um, view real estate. We're going to do sunset cocktails. It's just like a load of things that's going to happen uh, in the field trip. So don't think that this is just a, a boring conference, sit and listen to me speak all day long. No, we're going to put our hiking boots on. We're going to go for walks. We're going to go and see things. We get our hands dirty. Um, it's very interactive. Excellent. Yes, this is a fantastic opportunity with two people who I very much admire, Mikkel and Joshua Sheets. And just to, we're going to explain why Panama and some of this other stuff for the rest of the show, but just to conclude on some of the practicalities, this is expatmoney.com slash watchmen. And we'll have links in the description. That's expatmoney.com slash watchmen to see all of the details. Basically, this is not a free trip, right? It's going to be uh, just under $4,000 for a ticket. And once you get here, uh, a lot will be provided. Not everything, but a lot will be provided. So uh, you can look the, at the details on the uh, web page. And let's talk now about just a kind of a take a step back, big picture stuff. So why internationalization? Uh, so Mikhail, I think a lot of people might right now be in kind of a post-COVID complacency. They're recovering. Their countries seem okay now. The uh, the grandma in Australia is sitting on that park bench against lockdown orders that was arrested. Is She's basically recovered at this point, right? From the physical and emotional abuse from the police. She's okay. And for some people, their country is starting to look comfortable now. And they're maybe thinking that they're best to stay where they are. The online videos about moving abroad aren't as appealing suddenly. They're complacent, I think. Um, I wonder if you're good at this. Could you give us a wake-up call what and why in July of 2023, or at any time, should we be thinking about internationalization? So I think this is a great question. You know, I've been working in this industry for, for many, many years and, and traveling and, and testing these things out as a guinea pig. And it was quite funny, you know, five, 10 years ago, I'd be talking about these things. And, you know, there wasn't too many people that interested in it. You know, they wanted to have a second passport. They thought it was kind of cool or kind of quirky or neat, but there wasn't like a, a real desire or a real need for it. And the way that I like to describe it, Gabriel, it's, it's insurance. I mean, the work that I do is insurance, but instead of protecting, you know, it's not life insurance or health insurance, what we're dealing with is political insurance. Okay. Now there are a thousand and one weird and, and, very disturbing things that are happening in the world. And we can get into them if you want, but I, I assume your audience already knows um, what I'm referring to. And we probably don't need to spend too much time on those things. But let's, um, let, let's kind of dig into the idea of political insurance. So as the government kind of goes through these and locks people in homes and war and all of this stuff, you have to have your insurance plan set up in advance, right? You can't have, you can't get fire insurance the day after your house burns down, or you can't get automobile insurance the day after you get T-boned, right? It doesn't work like that. You got to have it set up in advance. So that's how I kind of look at having a plan B. And the things that go into a plan B are, are the residency itself, possibly a second passport. We would want to be looking at restructuring of businesses or assets through a corporate vehicle, whether that be uh, a corporation or a trust or a foundation, but having some type of corporate blocker there. And then certainly the banking or um, you know access to Bitcoin, self-custody, you know things that you have access to capital, which you're not going to have to ask permission for. Um, so those are kind of the simple things. And those are all things that we'll be talking about uh, with this Panama trip. We're going to get into later on of the reasons why Panama, why Panama is at the top of the list. But I think it is important to kind of flesh out, you know, what the definition of going offshore or being an expat is. And really, that's the, the that's what I work in. You know, it's it's protecting these types of things because we don't know what's going to happen in the world. And if you just kind of always come back to the idea of it's political insurance and it needs to be done in advance, then I think everything else in today's conversation will probably make a lot of sense. 
For sure. And I think my audience understands all of the benefits of internationalization. At this point, they just need to take the steps, which is what this uh, seminar is is all about. So let's talk about Panama. Let's let's start with why you why you chose Panama. So you were born and grew up in Canada. You didn't necessarily prefer it. So you started traveling around. Uh, more recently, you were living in Abu Dhabi and you left there and you were looking around the world for the best place for you to be right now. And you chose Panama. Why did you hone in on Panama? Okay, good question. So I was living in Abu Dhabi for eight years, as you mentioned. So Abu Dhabi was, I, I just turned 40 this year. So that's nearly a quarter of my life. Like that's a substantial amount of time in my life. And I was very happy in Abu Dhabi. I, I loved it there. We had a fantastic life. But um, I kind of saw a bit of writing on the wall, which what was happening in the country and some things that I did not agree with. So one of the first things was that they started blocking access to different messaging type of applications um, and things like Zoom. Now, I run a podcast, The Expat Money Show, and, and it was very stressful for me not having access to the technology that I needed. I didn't like that they were censoring the internet. So that was one thing. Another thing was that the US was being extremely aggressive to towards Iran. And I could I had seen what happened in Libya and Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq and all of these kind of neighboring countries to there. And I thought, well, wow, if they decide that they're going to go into Iran, probably they're going to use the UAE as a staging ground. And I did not like that idea at all. I'm very anti-war uh, on all fronts. I'm venomously opposed to, to interventionist type of mentality and in invading other countries. So I look at this and I go, all right, let's say that there is a war in the Middle East, a larger war in the Middle East, and they use the UAE as a staging ground. Then what kind of you know, retribution could there be for this? Well, at that time, they had um, expelled all Iranians from the country. And down the street from where I was living, not literally down the street, but you know, a short drive away was the nuclear power plants that they're building in Abu Dhabi. And I thought, well, that's probably a pretty solid target Target if, uh, if they wanted to strike back against the UAE for this. So I'm like, hmm. I got a family now and you know I'm a short drive away from nuclear reactors it's probably not a good idea. And then in the UAE if you guys have ever been over to Abu Dhabi or Dubai or really anywhere in the GCC countries you realize it's hot. And I don't mean this like oh you know I sweat a little bit or something like that. I mean like no it's plus 55 plus 56 degrees Celsius in the summertime. So you will die like legit people die every year from heat stroke. So if they do target the nuclear infrastructure there, and, and the majority of which is once the, um, the nuclear reactors are going online, they are slated, 60% of the energy is slated for desalination of water. So now you have a country which is not food independent, which is not water independent. And if they lose their access to energy, their ability to turn salt water into drinkable water has now disappeared. I'm like, this is just a terrible, terrible situation. So I started looking around in the world of viable countries that I could move my family to. And, and once again, this was a huge decision for me. This was my life and we loved it there. But I had to, once again, pick up my family and move. We looked at Thailand, which we thought is a beautiful country. We love the food and lots of cultural things. But I didn't like how it will never lead to naturalization, to citizenship. So you end up basically getting a long-term tourist visa. And we looked at some of the countries in Europe, and I didn't like what was happening with the EU. And we looked at some of the other Latin American countries like Costa Rica or Belize or Nicaragua, and it just didn't. these places just didn't have the infrastructure for me. I first had come to Panama 20 years ago, and I had very fond memories of it, and I had helped people with immigration to the country. So we picked Panama. So, so there are all kinds of desirable things about Panama. And let's just start with one of the obvious things that expats, especially expats with some money are looking for, which is taxation. Um, Panama, my understanding is territorial taxation, which means that if you're living in Panama uh, and you set up things correctly, your income earned outside of Panama will not be taxed. Could you talk about that? Yes, you're absolutely correct. So Panama is a territorial tax system. Now, there are many countries in the world that follow this type of territorial tax system. However, a lot of them 
it kind of falls in the gray zone and they really have not put into black and white on what type of businesses will actually actually constitute territorial and what, you know, so if you're physically located, even though the business might be outside of the country, maybe you're still going to be taxed on it. Panama has had very clear laws and regulations on this. As long as the money is generated outside of Panama and you're not selling to Panamanians, there's no tax for you here. So that is a huge advantage. On top of that, capital gains in the country, if once again generated outside of the country, there's no taxation in Panama. And even last year, Panama came forward and made a resolution on capital gains for Bitcoin. So if your crypto portfolio, there are gains and you physically live in Panama, there is no tax for you. That is a phenomenal situation to be in. I have not paid taxes on a better part of 20 years, and I don't plan on starting to pay taxes now. Um, you know, it's another one of these things that I is a I, I feel very passionate about is paying zero taxes. So Panama really ticks that box for us. Absolutely. Now, if you're an American and you owe the IRS money wh wherever you are, um, this might not be the case uh, because I don't think the foreign earned income tax exclusion would get somebody out of that situation because let's say their money was still being earned in the US. That would not be foreign earned income. Does that sound right to you? No, that's not right. So actually the way it works is that the foreign earned income exclusion matters where you are, not where the money is generated. Right. Okay. Panama, it's the opposite side. Panama cares about where the money is generated, but not where you are. So it kind of fits together hand in glove. So you can actually be a US citizen and living down in a territorial tax system. You can be paid from your US company, either as regular income or an online business or coach or consultant or dropshipping or Amazon FBA or any of these types of things. And then you can apply for the foreign earned income exclusion, which if you guys don't know, is one of the, the prime tools in the toolbox that we look at for Americans who go offshore. And it's $120,000 of income that gets excluded. So you're not paying taxes on that. And the really rad thing is that if your spouse is also an American taxpayer, there's a doubling effect. So now you're talking about just under a quarter of a million dollars where you're not subject to taxation in the United States. Once again, I'm not giving individual tax advice here, but it is a program that we're able to work on and advise clients on with my lawyers and CPAs to help them set it up. But we have to have somewhere else that you're going to be, right? We got to have that residency. We have to have that tax home for you. Well, Panama actually works for that. So you, it, it's this, you know, in between area, I wouldn't call it a gray zone because it's not a gray zone. It's all very clearly documented, but it is a two systems that match together really, really fluidly. Excellent. Excellent. Good to know. Now we're going to talk about ways that you can benefit from Panama without necessarily living there, such as banking. But for those who, let's say they are interested in this kind of territorial taxation, um, which has you living outside of your country of origin, um, or maybe you want to live in Panama, what is the residency process like for Panama these days? So there are 22, 21, 22, 23 different types of visas. Now let's put aside all of the the domestic help visas, the refugee visas, all of these types of ones, right? The visas that I work on are investment visas. Those are the, the prime ones. They give you the maximum amount of flexibility and are not too, too expensive. So I'll, I'll run through the two main programs and I'll try to highlight what the differences are. So the one that most people have probably heard of, if you know Panama, is the Friendly Nations Visa. The Friendly Nations Visa was started in 2012 by the previous administration. And the way it used to work was a $5,000 bank deposit and a company formation and would allow you to come in. Now, under the current administration, they changed the rules on it. They changed it to a $200,000 real estate investment. But more than that, what they did was they added a two-year provisional visa. And after two years, you have to make a second application to become a permanent resident. So it's still a very good option. And it's, uh, it's an option that a lot of clients take. However, this new administration, they also came out with a new visa when they got into power. And it's called the Qualified Investor Visa. This is the visa that almost all of my clients are doing now. I would say 95% of my clients do this visa. 
And the advantages are that there are no provisional requirements for it. It's an instant permanent residency. On top of that, you have to understand that it's a $300,000 real estate investment. So it's about 50% more. But to be realistic, for a decent place that you would want to live or even rent out in this country, you're looking at a $320,000, $330,000 place on the low end anyways. Panama is not some crappy third world country with no infrastructure and nothing going for it. This is a major metropolitan, very cosmopolitan. Panama City, there's, there's anything and everything you would want to do here. So you have to kind of relate the price of real estate to probably a, a tier two or tier three type of city in the United States. Certainly, it's a lot cheaper than New York or Miami or Los Angeles. But, you know, in most normal sized cities in the States, um, it probably would fall in line with that. Now, to kind of circle back to my point of why the provisional visa, it's good not to do that and go straight to permanent residency, is because they actually have a naturalization program in this country. So that means if you have your residency here, you have your permanent residency here, and you're in the country for five years, you can actually become a citizen. You can become a Panamanian, and they have a very strong passport. It's about 150, 152 countries, something like that. Visa-free travel, you get access to the EU, all of the Caribbean countries, Latin America, a lot of the places that you would want to go. So, you know, that is a, you know, not a free passport in that you have to pay legal fees, but if you're planning on living here anyways, it's very, very affordable. And I can tell you as someone who just spent a quarter of a million dollars doing my St. Keith citizenship by investment, that the prospect of getting a Panamanian one just for the legal fees, you know, $10,000 or something in legal fees is, is really, really, really affordable. It's it's one of these countries that is is welcoming to people who wants to come and, and become a resident. So Mikkel, Panama is known for its banking, and the event is going to have some talks on this topic, of course. But uh, just just talk to us about like how how is Panama banking so favorable? So you have to understand what Panama is here for. Why does Panama exist? Like, what is the the reason for this? So obviously, we have the Panama Canal. Panama Canal brings in billions of dollars of revenue into the country. You know, I think that they estimated at about seven billion dollars a year that come in. But actually, what's larger than that is actually the banking sector here. So this is the hub banking sector for all of Latin America. So you can figure there's probably about 20 countries in Latin America, and um, they all bank through Panama. And they have a vested interest in seeing Panama banking stable and secure. Now, we have 92, 93 international banks in the country, and you can go down to Calle Cincuenta, and it's just bank after bank after bank. And they have local Panamanian banks, they have international banks, and they have big conglomerate, you know, multinational banks here as well. And they, they have everything in between. Um, the banking here is much more conservative than what we would see in North America. First of all, by the capitalization ratios, which when we do presentations, I'm going to dig into a lot of the depth on the different types of banks. You know, today we're really doing just high level type of stuff. But at the conference that we're doing, we're going to get into a lot of the details on the capitalization, which banks to use, which programs, the KYC, the AML, all of these types of things. There's even opportunities to have private banking and VIP banking here. Like I have two accounts with two different banks at, at a VIP level, and I have my banker on WhatsApp. So if something happens or I need to do something, I just message her on WhatsApp and, and she takes care of it. You know, I, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of those things um, unless you're an, an, an immensely large account with, um, I don't know, Bank of America or something like that. I just, I don't think you're going to have your private banker there, but you can have a normal size account here and, and that is available to you. Another reason that the banking is so secure here is their lending practices. You know, the majority of the real estate in this country is non-financed real estate. So they're not lending out, you know, these really risky mortgages to people that can't offend, uh, afford it. So it is possible to get capital. It's not easy. And the rate of interest on these on these loans is a lot higher. And what they even do is they might make you sign a life insurance plan. So let's say that you wanted to buy a place and you had to put down 20% because there's none of this 5% or 0% down. Maybe it's 20% or 30% down. And you're going to take out, I don't know, a half a million dollars in, um, in a mortgage. Well, you now have to go out there and get a life insurance plan for that exact amount. And you need to have the beneficiary 
as the Panamanian bank. So it really reduces any of their risk of default on these. So if you look back to 2008 and 2009, when we had the financial crisis and um, all of these problems with the real estate markets, Panama was more or less not affected because almost all cases, it's cash real estate. So people aren't just buying like places that they can't afford. They're not buying five different properties and trying to rent them out and, you know, sending home or sending back the keys if they, if they go underwater on it. For this reason, I think that the banking here in Panama is something that people should really look at. And for foreigners, can they benefit uh, just as much from the banking as uh, residents? So this is a good question. Now, as a foreigner, you can get banking in this country. However, you have to have a residency here. Now, it's kind of this weird catch-22. Yeah, to get your residence, you have to have a bank account. And to get a bank account, you have to be a resident. So what we do is we have special relationships with a couple of key banks who will allow you to open a bank account provided that you are getting your residency. And during the KYC and AML process, you have to come down and do it in person. There's only one bank, and I won't mention the name of the bank, um, here live, but uh, but we will be talking about it at the conference that will allow you to do the opening of the bank account remotely. So you can figure 93 banks here, one will allow you to do it remotely. The other 92, no. And for almost every one of those 92, you have to make sure that you're doing your residency here. Now, once you have a residency in Panama, you can literally walk into any branch off the street and open up an account. I have like five or six or seven different banks here that I bank with in Panama, mostly because I want to try it out and I want to understand, I want to meet the bankers. And it's part of me being a guinea pig in this industry. What you need to understand is that if you're going to do your residency, we set you up with one bank. If you like that bank, great, you stay with them. If you don't like that bank, that's okay. After the residency, we can move you to a more conservative bank or a bank that maybe fits what you're after, The the ticks a lot of the boxes that you're after. Right. And Panama uses the US dollar, right? Correct. It's a U.S. dollar economy. However, the natural currency here is the Balboa. Now, the, the U.S. dollar is used in the street in commerce, but we still have a central bank here. So it's kind of kind of the best of both worlds. Like I know that we're not super bullish on U.S. dollar, but I can tell you, compare it to the Bolivia or the peso in Argentina or something like that. You know, those countries, they wish they were in U.S. dollars. So we're kind of protected in case something happens to the US dollar because we can always go back to the Balboa, but they're not inflating the currency away like they're doing in some of these other countries. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions about that, but but let's say that for another time. That's a very interesting kind of setup. Now, one thing that people might know the pa Panama for is the, the Panama Papers. And it's just, I guess one way of thinking about it, it's evidence that so many people make use of Panama as a place to bank or to do asset protection, this sort of thing. But another way of thinking about it, of course, is that it brought a lot of attention to uh, Panama. Is the Panama Papers, has that affected anything or is that not even worth talking about really? No, we can talk about it. I mean, it's have done a ton of research. I understand a lot about it. I even have my friend's uncle is part of the Fonseca family. I mean, by the way, the, the guys at Mosfan Fonseca are still walking the street. They were never charged with anything. What you guys have to understand about the Panama Papers, it was actually was not something that Panama did wrong. Right, right. Panama, the only thing that they did wrong was they did not properly protect their data. They had an online portal and they still had uh, information on clients there from years before and they should have removed that information. The only thing was a data breach, which was terrible. But actually the laws... They didn't do anything wrong. The people who broke the law were the politicians who lived in foreign countries who were keeping money in Panamanian accounts and not declaring it to their tax authorities. So if you want to point the finger, it's actually the politicians and a lot of these celebrities. There was some UK footballers and stuff like this. They're the ones who were not declaring the income. Everything we do at my company and any of the work I do with the offshore markets, it's not a question of, remember those kids games? I used to have a, a friend of mine, Joel, who would always say this. Remember the, the, the games, uh, hide and seek. It's not hide and seek, it's show and tell. And that's the way we look at it. Don't try to hide the information from your government because they're always going to find out everything. Stay in compliance, follow the law, do what you, is your responsibility to do, and you will be fine. Don't lie to the U.S. government and you know tax evasion. You're going to get busted for that, and that's 
a huge problem. I mean, people spend time in jail for that. That's orange jumpsuit type of thing. On the Panama side, they didn't really do anything wrong. They're still walking around free. They were never charged with anyone, with anything. The only people who did anything wrong was royal family, celebrities, footballers, politicians, a lot of these people who were doing it. Definitely. I, I, I wasn't assuming that people were, were doing things wrong. I was just uh, wondering if it affected kind of the sentiment or, or the kind of day-to-day stuff. I remember watching the uh, a documentary on the Panama Papers and they make it seem like such a such a big deal and these people are doing this and that. And partway through the documentary, they said something like, yeah, we haven't really found any criminal criminality here. And I yeah. just stopped and I said like, what, what are we doing here? It's slander. It's slander. That's it. They're just protecting their money as anybody in the world um, should do. So um, on the topic of kind of asset protection, another part of the uh, the Panama trip that we're discussing here is uh, gold vaults for people who would like to store precious metals outside of their home country. And for U.S. citizens, I think this is one of the only things that you can um, own and not report to the IRS, I believe. What makes Panama such a desirable place for precious metal storage? And maybe just talk about that. Sure. And just to wrap up the last piece on the Panama Papers, there it doesn't really affect us, like everyday people who are coming into Panama. There has been a lot of slander against Panama towards these things. Panama is still on the gray list. If you do a ton of business with the European Union, you might have a little bit of problems with your banking for internal and um, uh, incoming and external uh, outgoing transactions. But if you're US or American, you won't even notice. I mean, the I get transfers every day and there's no problems. It's, it's very, very clean. Um, a lot of the European countries don't like Panama because it's a tax-free country. And there's so many Germans and Italians and Spain, Spaniards who are moving here and not paying taxes back at their home. Got to pay your fair share. Oh, yeah, exactly. Got to build the roads. Come on. If you don't pay your taxes, who's going to build the roads? Okay, why is Panama attractive? Well, they do bonded and unbonded type of precious metals. So you can actually hold it in an international state, which means there's no taxes or import duties for bringing it into the country. The vault that I work with is in a tax-free zone. So that is really, really huge advantage from that. Um, It is a politically stable country. So we don't have... Um, first of all, there's no problems with any of the neighboring countries. So it's not like being in the Middle East or something close to where I was living. There was problems with neighboring countries, you know, like that just doesn't exist here. Costa Rica is not going to invade Panama. (laughs) Costa Rica doesn't even have a standing military and neither does Panama to defend itself. So we just don't have these types of problems. Um, add to that, we don't have an organized crime problem in this country, the same that you do in some of the other countries in Latin America. Um, not to say that there are there is zero crime here or that it doesn't exist, but it's just not at that same type of level that the other countries are. There's very little um, chance of socialism in this country, as Venezuela and Peru and Bolivia and all these countries have gone completely socialist. That's not going to happen here in Panama, and it's not going to happen because Panama is these these countries' bank accounts. You know, they might let their own country go to hell in a handbasket, but all of the wealthy people, the factory owners, the politicians, the family money, they all keep it here in Panama. So these are influential people. They won't allow socialism to touch Panama. So we kind of look at all of these things and look at this is kind of the 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 jewel in the center of all these countries, that is a safe harbor. And that's a good place to to keep your precious metals. Um, From the physical security side, I mean, I own multiple firearms. I have my concealed carry license. I've got a SIG P365 that I can carry around. So they have favorable gun laws here for self-protection. Good luck trying to get that in Mexico or something like that. Like your ability to own firearms is is very difficult. So the people at the vault are heavily armed. There are um, armed guards and security on site, not just uh, on site of the depository itself, but also in the area. So there's you know, physical security types of things that we can look at. I could probably go on on this topic for probably an hour straight, but I'll just, I'll shut up for a second. Well, it's it's a very interesting topic, and I look forward to hearing more about uh, this particular uh, precious metals vault. I was listening to a episode that you did on Panama, and I'll just mention some things here quickly. Uh, some of the conveniences of of Panama, you know, it's it's often on the eastern time zone, 
uh, of the US, which is very important for a lot of people who do business. Uh, the airport is a major Latin American hub. You know, Spanish is a fairly easy language to learn. So there's some conveniences like that. In terms of lifestyle, Mikel, uh, for the people who want to spend time here, they want to live here, maybe. Uh, you know, it's a Caribbean country. It's warm weather. No hurricanes is my understanding. Lots of coastline. And maybe not quite as expensive as, as some Western cities, though. What you were saying before, we might question that. Uh, talk about some of the lifestyle aspects of Panama since you've been living there for a while. Yeah, we've been here for four years now, going on our fifth year. It is a modern cosmopolitan city. I mean, I live in downtown Panama City. I also have a beach house and I'm building my house out in the community that we were talking about before. So it's depending what style of life you want to have. If you want to have a farm, you can do that here. If you want to be on the beach on the Pacific side and go surfing or kite surfing or stuff like that, you can do that. If you want to be on the Caribbean side and scuba dive all day or snorkel, you've got the San Blas Islands and, and lots of area on the Caribbean side. If you want this city aspect life that, that I really enjoy, there's VIP cinemas. I mean, there's three VIP cinemas close to where I live with you know, you order a beer or a bottle of wine or something like that on an iPad and they bring it to you and the footrest goes all the way up. And I mean, I think the tickets are $17 a piece or something like that. And my daughter, we take her, it's like nine bucks for hers for VIP sitting. So there can be affordable, like it can be um, less expensive than a lot of the Western countries. I just don't, I just never want people to come down here and think this is the same as like, I mean, I used to live in Guatemala and I was living on like $10 a day or $15 a day. You know, I was living in Southeast Asia and it was just so ridiculously cheap. Things were almost free. However, those countries didn't have any of the infrastructure. Panama has the infrastructure. So you can have a Western style life if that's what you're after. And it's going to cost you maybe a half or a third, but it's not going to cost you like a fifth or a tenth, you know? So it's cheaper, but not, not, so much cheaper. But I guess when you add in the facts that it's tax free and probably your health insurance is maybe a quarter of the price and you're naturally eating organic food and um, getting lots of sunshine, it will end up being a lot less expensive. Yeah. Uh, Panama City, which is kind of what we've been talking about and where Mikel is, it's a, it's a serious city. It's a legitimate city. And Panama as a Latin American country is kind of unlike them in, in being closer to what we'd call first world countries. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a fascinating place. Um, as, as we wrap up this kind of teaser for the Panama trip, Mikkel, is there anything that we did not talk about regarding Panama that you would like to bring up? Well, I just want to make sure that people understand for the trip, all of the hotels are included. All of the conference material, uh, the room, the teas, coffees, the breakfasts, everything like that is all included. All of the transportation is included with, except for you going to and from the hotel, I think pretty much everything else is included. We do a couple of dinners. We go out for cocktail hour and happy hour and drinks and things like that. A lot of that stuff is included. We're going to go see the Panama Canal. So your tickets to go see the Panama Canal are included. So in that price tag, there is a lot there. There is really a lot. And then you have to think, well, if you needed to go out there, and try to put this together yourself. And you need to do all the transportation or rent a car or, I mean, there's no way it would be, you would come in at this price. And there's really a very limited amount of seats. This is not a huge conference with hundreds of people there. It's a small private investors tour with you, me and Joshua actually there ourselves. And, you know, 10 hours, 12, 14 hours a day with everybody. So it's um, it's a very different type of level than just going, sitting in a conference room, some boring conference room for 12, for 10 hours a day, just listening to someone speak at you. This is really dynamic, a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, brainstorming, masterminding ideas. You know, we can really go through it to make sure that it makes sense for you and your family. And the, the last thing I'll kind of mention at this is you don't have to make a decision yet if Panama is right for you. All you have to do is make a decision if you're curious about Panama and you want to learn more. Because that's it. Is you, you know, worst case scenario, you come down and drink a couple bottles of wine with me and eat some good steak and you learn a lot. And if you don't like it, then you walk away. It doesn't matter. 
But if it, if it does make sense for you, if it makes sense for your family, you've taken a really important step to protecting those that you love. Because really, in today's day and age, you have to have a plan. You just have to. There's just there's no question about it. You can't close your eyes and cross your fingers and hope and pray that things will get better. You know, you got to be a responsible adult and accurate thinking and, and, and have a plan in place. Exactly. I think there are a lot of benefits to this event, uh, many, many benefits that we've discussed and that you can also find at the, the website link, which is expatmoney.com slash watchman. Make sure you go to that one so that we can know that you found it from this podcast. Yeah. So thank you all for listening. And Mikkel, thank you again for joining. Pleasure is all mine. Looking forward to January and, uh, and meeting you in person, Gabriel, and, and catching up and uh, yeah, helping a lot of people. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs>